You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. Serious talk about the sacred book. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Bible for Normal People. Today is a very special treat for us. Our guest is Dennis Lamoureux. And Dennis was the very first person we ever interviewed for the podcast way back in December 2016. I know it's August, it's been a while, we kept him waiting. Fact is he owed me money, and that's just the way it's gonna be, Dennis. I hope you're listening to this, you know, because you know, I, I don't do that, all right? So anyway, hey listen, we're excited to have Dennis here on the podcast because he's one of a few people who control this area of the topic for today, the Bible, evolution, and Christian faith. He controls it very well because he knows both sides of the issue. He's a trained scientist, and he's also a trained biblical scholar and theologian. And you don't have that combination very often. I don't have it. Right? I'm, I'm just a biblical scholar. I wrote this book a few years ago, The Evolution of Adam. I stuck to what I knew, biblical interpretation. I didn't get into science. But Dennis is able to manage both of those worlds very, very effectively. And, uh, you know, it's tough because it takes training to do science and it takes training to do theology, not the same kind of training. But still, you know, it, 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 you have to have some background in both to really contribute to what is a difficult um, complex interwoven kind of topic that everyone's talking about and it's not going anywhere so anyway our guest is Dennis Lamoureux and we hope you enjoy our first ever recorded podcast the way I look at evolution I mean I look at how we're created in the womb I mean I've yet to meet a Christian who believes the Lord comes out of heaven attaches an arm or attaches a leg to their developing body in their mother's womb. Instead, we see ourselves being created through natural processes, through embryological processes. And sort of as Psalm 139 says, that the Lord knit us together fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's womb. Well, welcome everyone. We're here today with Dennis Lamoureux coming to us, joining us by phone all the way from Alberta, Canada, because there's no internet in Canada. Is that right? <laughs> That's what I, I read that on, on a um, on a an, on a non fake website someplace. Well, there you go. You shouldn't right be reading those things. <laughs> anyway, well, Dennis is the associate professor of science and religion at Saint Joseph's College in the University of Alberta, and that is I did not know this, Dennis. That's the first tenure track position in Canada dedicated to teaching and research on the relationship, is a mouthful, between scientific discovery and Christian faith. That's correct. That's pretty amazing. Well, it's quite a privilege. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with a lot of science and religion is people sort of do it as their fifth course every other year, and I get to do this all the time. Mm. And uh, the advantage of that, it's just like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And I guess I can sort of announce this, that uh, coming in late January, I'll be doing a MOOC, taking my course, putting it as a massive open online course through Coursera. So uh, one of the I've done this course over a hundred times now, so it's very polished and uh, right. it's, it, it's been tested in the classroom for 20 years. And in particular, I'm at a, this is a public university in Canada. We do have, religious colleges associated as affiliate colleges. So all my students are University of Alberta students and I get a wide range of belief. And so it's an, an opportunity to test it and make it accessible to the public so we can have a dialogue on this. And right. overall, it's, the response has been very positive. Right, right. Well, and it's also, Dennis, I think important to name that you have degrees in dentistry, which was fun to find out, but also theology and biology. So as we talk about faith and evolution, you might actually have a few things to say. Well, possibly. I, st <laughs> I still even remember a little bit of dentistry, though. I retired uh, back in 02, so I practiced for 25 years, and it, uh, it was, you know, it, it was great as, as a job that I could go to grad school and still practice dentistry and so on. Um, Dennis, I'm, isn't I'm, it I'm, true, though, too, that your dentistry, your, your, your study of um, – teeth, what, did, did that feed into your growing understanding of the nature of evolution? Totally and completely. Okay. So the, the root is dentistry first, then theology. I was still an anti-evolutionist, and uh, 
you know, I have to speak as a Christian at the end of my theology PhD. I mean, I could have started teaching, but the Lord sort of put in my heart that if I'm going to get involved in this origins debate, how much science do you really know, Dennis? And Lord, the answer is I'm a clinician. I can know how to fix people's teeth, but I really don't know much about evolutionary biology. So th that was the lead in. So having the background in teeth, and of course, the next piece of the puzzle in paleontology, it's there are a lot of teeth. It's a lot of dominant uh, evolutionary studies come through teeth because teeth are the hardest of all structures, so the ones that will chance to fossilize the best. And so I, I entered that second PhD as an anti-evolutionist. I mean, I would do the PhD with integrity, but the original plan was, and this is a, a theme that you see a lot in my generation. We go get a secular degree in, in evolution and then come back and attack evolutionary biology. And so that was my original plan. However, I mean, I, I, I had the advantage that I, you know, come to terms with the Bible is not a book of science. I mean, a scientific concordist or simply concordist view of Genesis wouldn't work. So I was free of that. And I was open to the possibility that if evolution was true, I wouldn't even blink on my, on my faith because I realized that isn't what scripture was doing. Right. And so after three and a half years of seeing the date, and of course, one of the big things we're all taught as evangelicals is, there are no transitional forms, you know, those in-between forms. Well, believe you me, I started seeing them and tried to put some ad hoc arguments together till finally, and you hear this term, I didn't invent it. You'll often hear people who've done enough biology and in particular evolutionary biology say that the evidence for evolution is simply overwhelming. And that's so very true. And, and now the, the, the quest continues now that we're doing evolutionary genetics. I mean, I got convinced on the bones, the teeth, and, you know, I started to see some molecular stuff. But right now, I mean, if you really, the best evidence for evolution are the genes in your body. Mm. And um, this is what's happening. And this, this genetic revolution is amazing. We're seeing this in medicine. That's the direction medicine is going. So a lot of undergraduate students, before going to med school, they're doing all this genetics. And, of course, they see all these commonalities between different living organisms and pseudogenes and things like that. And, well, exactly. you, you mentioned, uh, Dennis, you used a word earlier, a concordist approach. Yes. Can you explain what that is? Yep. And you know something? That's one of these key notions. I did not learn that through my evangelical theological experience. Um, I learned that afterwards, but that term has been around in the literature for at least 100 years or so. And concordism, think of the word to accord. And this is a deep assumption within the evangelical tradition and really in a lot of Christian traditions, whereby we think there's an accord between statements about nature and scripture and what we actually find out there in nature. So the vast majority of evangelicals are concordists. They assume that scripture will align with the scientific facts. And well, my experience is, is when I started doing the scientific facts, I saw that it didn't align with scripture. In fact, the more I looked at scripture, and I might add, I mean, I, 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 when I walked into graduate school at, in Regent College in 1984, I mean, I was a fiery young earth creationist. And what Regent did in a very gentle and wonderful way is slowly show me that, hey, there are a number of structures here within the scripture that you just simply cannot align with, um, with nature. And, and one of the easiest places was the structure of the universe in the Bible. There is a three-tier universe in the Bible, and you don't even have to go very far into the Bible to see some of this. Second day of creation talks about God creating a firmament, the Hebrew rakia, or the Greek stereoma. These are hard, firm structures where God takes a firmament, lifts the waters above from waters below. And of course, most people are going, what are you talking about? And I first put a, first time I started reading scripture at a question mark, and really, that's just in the ancient world. They look up, they saw it was blue. To think there was a sea of water up there made perfect sense. You know, it sometimes spat at you when it rained. And fourth day of creation, the sun, moon, and stars are placed in the firmament, and that's exactly what it looks like from an ancient So, so Dennis, this, this concordist view, right? Yes. Yep. That, the Bible itself doesn't allow that. Is that what you're saying? I'm Exactly. Well, okay. I, I, let's put it this way. I have no trouble with any theory uh, with regards to, you know, different hermeneutical theories. And so if one, someone wants to assume concordism works, and you know, that's not 
irrational. I mean, I believe that God inspired the scripture. The Holy Spirit inspired the scripture. God also created the world. So as a first theory, if you wish, I think it's reasonable to suggest maybe the science and scripture should align. But here's the test. Go out into scripture, go out into nature, and that's where the discontinuity occurs. Now, for me, for some people, when you first learn that, and when I first discovered it, boy, it was really uncomfortable. Then all of a sudden, you have the sense of the Spirit saying, hey, I, I, I accommodated in the same way that when God spoke to me as a new Christian, and he came down to my level, so too the Holy Spirit came down to the level of the ancient Hebrews and used their ancient understanding of nature to get across the big idea that it was God, the God of the Hebrews, that created the world. So it's, it's an accommodation down to ancient Near Eastern peoples. Now, the Holy Spirit could have done the following. Put a Hebrew in a trance and scribbled out, I created through the Big Bang and through evolutionary biology. Now, who 3,500 years ago would have understood that? No one. But again, it's back to grace. When God speaks to us personally, and I often say this to my students, to the Christians wrestling with evolution, and scripture and wrestling with concordism and that because we're all we most evangelicals assume concordism but we don't even know the term when the holy spirit speaks to us does he not come down to meet us exactly where we are in our lives and the answer everyone will say is yes i'll say the same thing happens when the holy spirit inspired scripture some 3500 years ago used their categories to get across the big idea that it is the god of the hebrews who created the world and that God created us in his image, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, we're all sinful. And it's those big ideas, those central theological ideas, that the Holy Spirit delivered, but using, if you wish, a vessel, an ancient vessel, that ancient people would have understood. So when you talk about that, Dennis, you know, there's an approach that would be kind of about the, the phenomenology of language. So how the, yes. the Bible just describes creation in the way that we would see it if we were just to go out and look. And you're talking yep. about the Bible being written from an ancient Near Eastern understanding of science. How do those? How are those similar approaches, and how are those different approaches? I'd say I'd say the two are connected. And here's a categorical difference that I make. We have to make a distinction between an ancient phenomenological perspective. So, for example, when the ancients looked up, and I mean, I'm just not talking about the Hebrews, I'm talking across the board, the right. Mesopotamians, the Egyptians. When they saw the sun crossing the sky, did they literally believe the sun was crossing the sky? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, you and I, when we see the sun going from east to west, we know it's due to the rotation of the earth. And it's not Wait a minute, are you sure about that? You, slow down. Slow down here. Okay, I believe you. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> well, I was just—I was assuming maybe Pete, you're one of the twenty-five percent who think the sun really does move across the and sky. And maybe I am. Is, maybe I am. Dennis. Which is a haunting number in 19, for two thousand fourteen. Twenty-five percent of Americans believe the sun literally moves across the sky. Anyway, back to us. And here's the distinction where some confusion can occur. When we see the sun going across the sun uh, across the sky. We know it's because we're spinning on our axis on the earth. So it's not that it literally moves, it appears to move. And that's the difference between us and them, the ancients. The ancients saw everything from their phenomena, but they thought it literally moved. We see it move, but we know it's due to our spinning. So we have to distinguish an ancient phenomenological perspective from a modern phenomenological perspective. And proof that the ancients believe that is, and it's not so long ago, that's what the Galileo affair was all about. It was not about a flat earth. Everyone believed in a flat earth in the early uh, 17th century. It was whether the earth moved or not. That was the debate. And so what Galileo was doing, he's putting us, you know, uh, taking Copernicus's heliocentric model and putting us on the so-called third rock from the sun and we're spinning on our axis. So, he had a modern phenomenological perspective, while everyone mostly prior to that, with the exception of a few Greeks, believed the sun literally moved across the sky. Mm. Yeah. So the two, coming back to the, the original question, um, and this is why uh, reading the ancient or eastern literature is so important. You know, Pete's done a great job in his writings. Uh, Kent Sparks is another guy. He's one of my heroes who's just this is, you know, the things we learn by reading the ancient Near Eastern literature. And so when it comes to their understanding of nature, 
it is exactly the same as what we see in the scriptures, a three-tier universe with an underworld at the bottom, the earth where we're standing, and the heavens above. And, you know, it's in one of the most amazing passages we tend to overlook in Scripture. You know, I go to a Pentecostal church, and we have a lot of praise and worship music uh, at start our service. And we often sing Philippians 2, the, the fantastic uh, Canodic hymn, whereby Jesus pours himself out to become a human. And in there, in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, it basically goes like this. Uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord where? In heaven, on earth, and of course, most of our English translations say under the earth, and no, we're not talking about Australia, but the actual Greek is katakthonios. Kata is an intensifier, meaning down, and kathonios, or phonic realm, is the underworld. So here is Jesus. Lord of heaven, earth, and the underworld. And so what's going on here? The Holy Spirit is accommodating, allowing Paul to use the science of his day to get across the theological message that Jesus is Lord of the entire universe. Mm. Well, you see, Dennis, why, um, why do you, you deal with college students, right? And you yes. deal with you know, normal people who think through this stuff. What, in, in your experience, why do you think this is such a major hurdle for people to get over. Yeah, well, here it is. And this is why I'll, I will always be an evangelical. Evangelical Christians love the word of God. They, do a, they just love the word of God. That's why I'm an evangelical, because I focus my theology starting with the word of God. But, and here's the but, because we created Bible schools, you know, and stepped away from the university and created the Bible schools, they were not given the liberty to, to think outside the box. And that continues to be a problem today in that I know guys who hold the views I do, but will not say it publicly for fear of losing their jobs. Um, a problem of the Bible school movement is by when you move out of the, you know, the public universities, the big universities, it takes a lot of money to run science departments, and a lot of these Bible schools simply don't have the money to run the big science departments. And as a consequence, and this is really a sad testimony, that we have closed our, eye, our eyes to the book of God's works, that is nature, and only focused on the book of God's words, the scriptures. And if you're focusing only on the scripture and you're not informing your theology with what's going on in the natural world, it's easy for this to result in a tradition that is completely concordist. And that is really what the story of evangelicalism is. We are a concordist tradition. We assume it. We don't even know the term concordist. It's in our Sunday schools. You know, when I went back to church as an adult convert at age 25, steeped in concordism and wasn't even aware of it until finally I'm going to grad school and starting to say, well, this is an assumption maybe we have to start to think about. So, so it's embedded in the tradition, I think, Pete. It is very embedded sociologically. Uh, oh, yeah, it, it's a sociological phenomenon as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it's part of the narrative that we have. I, I should say we, but, you know, the, the, the Christian world that you're describing is an evangelical and fundamentalist world, which, you know, both America and Canada certainly have. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's part of a narrative that we have that describes our own realities, and it, it is. let go of that stuff. Well, I'm, I'm going to say something really rude. Thomas S. Kuhn, instructor of scientific revolutions, he says, how do scientific revolutions occur? One death at a time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a generational thing. Right. But I think the move is underway. And within the evangelical world, we don't canonize individuals and make them saints. But I think if we had the, you know, if, if we started doing that, one of the first guys I think it should be canonized is Francis Collins. Mm -hmm. Francis Collins, and it's, his book's been out 10 years now, The Language of God, I really think started the ball rolling on this. Yeah. And then your next piece of the puzzle, you got Biologos that's emerging that's completely unabashed and affirming uh, biological evolution. Uh, the American Scientific Affiliation that's been around since 1941 is, I, you know, I go to the meeting every year. I mean, it's, it's, it's embracing an evolutionary paradigm. So the process is underway. And the other thing is, you know, I teach mostly undergrads. I've got evangelicals coming in. 
And the evangelicals are not ferociously anti-evolutionary as I was and my classmates, say, back in the mid-1980s at Regent College. So the process is underway, and uh, I, I think, you know, within a generation, this, this thing will go by the wayside in the same way that the Galileo debate and affair went by the wayside. And yet you have Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis building an ark. Yeah. And there are a lot of people well, here. Yeah, and so, you know, Pete, here's what I'm about to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'm a distance away so you don't throw a book at me or anything like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the church the church needs the Ken Hams because there's some people who will go to their grave as young earth creationists, and I don't want to take that away from them whatsoever. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I wouldn't I throw a buddy. Buddy for that. I agree I, with that. Uh, well, oh, no, it's it's true. In fact, mm. I think I get when I present young earth creationism in class. I mean, my young earthers just say, "Man, that was, you know, that's better than what they learned in Sunday school." I mean, you know, because I I I know young earth creationism like the back of my hand. Uh, I'll give you an example. I get invited in churches. I always say, only to the young adults. We call them college and careers up here. I do not want to do an adult Sunday school. Um, for about 10 years now, I no longer preach when I get invited on the road. I say to the, when, I, when they ask me, say, look, I'm too visible. I don't want to walk into your church. People can figure out who I am on the internet. I mean, I'm known as the evolution guy. And I don't want to be a stumbling block to these wonderful saints. And they are wonderful saints. So we disagree on the age of the earth. I'm more to affirm the, the reality of Christ in their life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't want to be a stumbling block there. However, when I do go in church, as I say, let's not make a fanfare about it. Let's just talk about the college and careers, the young adults, and we'll have a discussion. And I'm happy to make a contribution there. And sometimes when I'm going to places, I say, you know, instead of being in your church, put me in some college near the church so, you know, we don't, we don't create a stumbling block to some of the saints because, you know, this is, right. this is difficult. You know, I know this firsthand when I had to sit down, my wonderful mother who prayed me into the kingdom and said to her, mom, I'm an evolutionist. And she did not take kindly to that. It was very difficult. And she had to hear it from me because I was becoming a public person. And I, I didn't want one of her friends to tell her she had to, to hear it from me. And so, but with a little time and, you know, She's, you know, I've have had her read some of my books. She slowly came to terms in realizing that, you know, faith is not about evolution. And she now sees, you know, evolution is the Lord's way of creating. Right. You gave her books? Uh, you, I, gave her, her I gave her drafts. I gave her chunks of drafts of, of, uh, of books and just asked her to, you know, do some editing. Tell me what you think about this. And yeah. <laughs> she, she was, she, you know, it, 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 it's great. sort of. Mums are great, and it, it's the starts off slowly in terms of the first piece of the puzzle is a shocking one, and it was shocking for me, is to start recognizing that there's an ancient understanding of nature within Scripture. I mean, I use the term ancient science. Uh, people don't like the term science. Let's just call it an ancient understanding of nature like the three-tier universe. And I always start with astronomy. That's the easy one, because everyone knows we, we're, on a, we're on a planet spinning on right. its axis going around the Earth. And then from there, we, we, we move forward. And of course, you know, the last piece of the puzzle is always the issue of human origins and human evolution and the Adam question, which, you know, you've... Well, that one see, so what Adam. did it for you, Dennis? I mean, because there are a lot of people listening and people out there who are sort of looking for permission, theological permission, to be able to explore different you ways. You know... What did it for the, you? What, what happened? Well... Before I, I give you the what happened, let me tell you this word permission that you've just used, I think is so, so very important. And people like you, people like John Walton, people like Kent Sparks have given us as evangelicals permission to start thinking outside the box and in particular to start recognizing those ancient elements in the scripture and to say this will not undermine our faith. 
Now back to what happened to me. It was, it was, it was, it was at Region College, which I went during the mid '80s. So J.I. Packer was there, Bruce Walke was there, Gordon Fee, Michael Green. I mean, they called it the golden age. It was fantastic going to Regent during those years. And little by little, and I should mention the guy who I dedicated the book to, Lauren Wilkinson, who is a literary scholar. And you can probably imagine the battle that went head on. A literary scholar with Lammer, who's a dentist, who knows nothing about literature, maybe can write prescriptions and that's about it. But they slowly and gently, as just going through the process of the three years at Regent, started to see some of these ancient elements. And at first, it's not comfortable. Then you see more of it. And, in the, and it's the same process when it came to evolution. First time I saw a transitory form, I tried writing it off. Then you see more transitory forms. And then keeps building, keeps building. And I will tell you that there was a moment. I mean, the thing was building at Regent College. There was a moment. It was my very last paper. And it was recognizing that in the second verse of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, the dark, watery chaos, that's when creation starts. And what that did for me, and it was actually Bruce Wolke who made it very clear, again, another one giving me permission to say, the world is in place and there's no mention of when it got, or the earth is in place and there's no mention of when it got created. And what that did to me as a young earth creationist is completely discombobulated me from being able to date the earth because the scripture made it very clear that the earth was there and there was no mention of when it was created. I mean, I remember the day like it was yesterday. I had everything in for two degrees. My thesis was in. I just had this one paper. And I was sitting in the med library where I did all my work. And I sat there and I just burnt inside. And I just, I mean, I was just furious that I went and gave up this wonderful military career to come to, to follow this fantasy of becoming a young earth creation scientist. And here it is, the scripture that's undermining me completely. And I had this moment of complete madness where I said to myself, to heck with all this, I was going to leave everything on my carol right there. I wasn't even going to go back to my apartment to grab my stuff. I was just going to the parking lot, getting in my car, and driving 700 miles to go back to Edmonton to reinvent my life. Wow. The madness only lasted for about 20 seconds, and I'll tell you, it was pure darkness. But at the same time, and here's sort of an intelligent design argument coming your way, Vancouver in the spring, there's nothing more beautiful than the blue sea, the green of the trees, and the, and the snow-capped mountains. And I looked at this, and it was like the Holy Spirit just reaching out his arms, putting them around me, and saying, look it, I'm here, you know I'm here, you can feel me being here. Your job was to open the library at 10 or at 8 in the morning and close it at 10. My job, speaking of the Holy Spirit, was to teach you what's going on in Scripture. And therefore, what I'm going to do is now I see these ancient elements in Scripture. I know the Holy Spirit allowed this, and that's going to dictate how I'm going to do my theology. In other words, I will submit to the very words in the Word of God, and from there I'll build my theology. And so from that moment on, I just realized, the text, if the text shows stuff that clashes with what I learned in Sunday school, there's probably a real good chance it wasn't correct in Sunday school. And that's so, really the history. Yeah, that's, I mean, you, you, you've said so many things there that I think I know a lot of people who could relate to that and maybe need to hear it too. Um, in other words, you see, a tipping point wasn't simply somebody ramming evolutionary evidence, let's say, down your throat, you had had that, but what needed to happen was you had, you, you had to see that the Bible really doesn't work that way. Yes. No, right. you, you hit a spot on. Pete, I was still a flaming anti-evolutionist at that point. Right. What, what happened at Regent College, and I say this to my students, and I'll <laughs> say it the way I say it to them, I say this as respectfully as I can. I left young earth creationism for biblical reasons. Science had nothing to do with it because I was still an anti-evolutionist. And that was the key. I did scripture before I did science. And as, it, and as I look back, I mean, as a new Christian, I was starting to get a sense of calling. 
And the Lord made it very clear that I should do theology before I do, before I go down to the Institute of Creation Research with Henry Morris and Dwayne Gish. In fact, I wrote letters to Gish and, and, and Morris saying, I really feel the Lord wants me to do some work in Genesis 1 to 11 before I come down to El Cajon, California and join forces with you guys to attack all these evolutionists. And, and Gish was kind enough to, uh, to uh, write a letter back. And, he, and, you know, God bless him. And he said to me, you know, okay, but I want you to be, be, be aware of J.I. Packer. He's a very liberal Christian. And, you know, now I look at it today and thinking, Packer's a liberal? You won't find a more wonderful Christian than Jim Packer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had that in mind. And so the, the, the process, there was no real ramming. What it, and this is what graduate school, you either show up or you don't. I showed up. I, did, I had a sense of calling, so I did try to do my very best. And Regent College was fantastic. I mean, they put the stuff in front of our noses and said, well, what do you guys think? They allowed for dialogue. Um, and we wrestled with it. But the one thing I will say was so great about Regent, you know, Packer, Waltke, Wilkinson, these, these guys were wonderful, wonderful men of faith. They, they continue to be wonderful men of faith. I still am in contact with them. And I'll tell you, that, that really impacted me in the sense that these guys are true deal, real deal believers, and they're showing me some stuff, and here's the irony of it, in Scripture itself, that I wasn't being taught in Sunday school. And it's back to that dictum that I walked out of Regent, that no matter what shows up in the Scripture, I will submit to the very words in the Word of God. That's how I build my theology. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's part of both our experiences in theology. I mean, it kind of shocked us when we first saw it. But when all the dust is settled, I'm sitting there going, well, I still feel this, the Holy Spirit moving me. I still feel God is Lord of my life. I just have a, I just have, a, I have an appreciation of what the Holy Spirit was doing in the revelatory process by accommodating and using ancient categories to make it accessible to ancient people. So, you know, Dennis, you talk about the text coming first. That was kind of the, actually the thing that changed your mind. There are a lot of Christians who will read that same text and they won't have that moment that causes them to think differently about Genesis and other things. So what, what was the structure of the environment you were in? Your, what were the relationships? What was it that you feel like led to this paradigm shift where others who may have gone a similar path or who do go similar paths reading the text again and again, and they, they don't come to that mind changing moment. Um, what well, was it in the text or in their environment or how did that happen? How did that happen? Well, it's, it's just that, and you know, God bless the Sunday school teachers. It's just that there's a large difference from what we learn in Sunday school mm -hmm compared to what we learn at a really good graduate school like Regent College with Bruce Walkin and J.I. Packer teaching us. Um, in Sunday school, the people who are teaching in Sunday school, and again, God bless them, they're wonderful, but they simply have not been equipped with, say, what Pete and I have been exposed to by going to graduate school. And that's the difference. The difference is one of information. But they're getting um, that, you know, they're getting that information from somewhere, curriculum, the denomination. Is there a well, breakdown in this scholarship getting to the Sunday school teachers somewhere along the way? Well, there's a breakdown, and it sort of comes back to one of our earlier questions of what's going on in the evangelical colleges. You know, the first generation, the, these early generations of evangelical colleges, which are steeped in a concordist hermeneutic. I mean, that's, that's part and parcel. Now, is that starting to change and starting to break down? The answer is yes. You know, think about what John Walton, who's at Wheaton, wrote, you know, when he does his books on Genesis. Think about Pete and his book on Adam. Um, the process is underway. So here I am. Yeah, i am come under the rubric of a professional academic. But if you want to know what makes my heart move, it's to help equip the saints so they can, so they don't have to go through what, the literal 13 years of graduate school that I went through, I, our, our goal as writers is to try to distill it and make it accessible, and in particular, so, so readers can have ownership of the material. Uh, and in case in point, in the mid-1980s when I started this voyage, the term evolutionary creation just was not part of the dialogue. 
And there were no evol- now there were some evolutionary creationists, but they were they were below the radar. Rarely did they come up. However, it is now changed. So it's really a categorical shift going on. Mm. Think about Pate's book or my book. This stuff would not have been written in the 70s and 80s, and we wouldn't be teaching at evangelical schools with the stuff we've written because we'd be fired immediately. We'd be blocked. But this, it is now changing. Regrettably, some people have lost their jobs along the way in this process, but it's getting better and better. So what, what needs to be done? This, this is why I think Pete's book on Adam is a great book. It, well, let, let's, let's bring it one step back. His, his book on incarnation and inerrancy, I mean, that, that, that was, that's the stellar book. Uh, um, it, 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 I told Pete the story. I, I had a student who was in my class, went and listened to Pete at a course. A student emailed me back and he said, you plagiarized Peter Enns. And I said, I don't even know who Peter Enns is. <laughs> and then he says, you got to read this book. And I read Pete's book. I'll tell you where I got my stuff was from uh, Clark Pinnock back in the mid eighties. And, and it was one of those moments. I will tell now I'm at the PhD level, uh, mid eighties, this is late eighties. And uh, Clark Pinnock comes to Wycliffe college at the university of Toronto and gives a lecture on his new book called the scripture principle, which in effect is everything Pete and I are saying in terms of recognizing the ancient near Eastern categories, the notion of accommodation. And I remember that lecture like it was, like it was yesterday. I mean, this guy just, this guy put pieces together. We're floating around in my head. And, and it's, it's that sort of stuff that's emerging. And that's why it's important that scholars not only write stuff most people can't read, but also write stuff that is accessible to the church. And the process is going on right now. It's mm-hmm. getting better. Think, think of this conversation. Think of the web that we're going to be able to put this everywhere. Um, the process is underway. And, and Pete, you know, Pete's one of the, He's one of my heroes. I mean, in terms of the stuff he's done in helping Christians come to terms with, yeah, it really is the word of God, but we've got to realize that it's contextualized through a thin and ancient Near Eastern context. Hmm. Well, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times, Dennis, your book, which we haven't mentioned yet. So, I mean, you've written a few, but the, 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 your latest one is called Evolution, Scripture, and Nature Say Yes! Capital letter yeah. with an exclamation point. And um, I, I imagine, you know, a lot of what you're saying here is also wrapped up in that book, right? Yeah, it, it is. And, and who's your audience? Who are you writing to in this book? That's important. Let, let, let me start off with something that is thunderous. The publisher is Zondervan. Who? Zondervan. Oh, yeah. Who would have thought Zondervan would publish a full evolutionist, and they have. Isn't that good? My, oh, I mean, when when the email came, I, I, I figured out what the phone number was of this guy, and I phoned him. And I said, if you're punking me, this is not a funny punk. <laughs> because for 20 years, I've been knocking on the door of Zondervan, and the answer's been no, no, no. And all of a sudden, yes. And um, the audience... The audience, as I outline in the beginning of this book, is undergraduates and high school students. So it's not a very technical book, but it's the book I wish I would have had way back in 1971, 72, when I'm walking into university. Because like most of my generation, I was trapped in this either or thinking of a dichotomy. You're either a young earth creationist or you're an atheist evolutionist. There was no middle ground. And of mm-hmm. course, by the time Christmas came along, I'm in biology. Our first course is on evolution. I mean, church is done. And that was a mistake simply because I wasn't given middle grounds. Now, in high school, I had this wonderful biology teacher, which, by the way, I should have been an engineer because my, my, my shtick was math. But because he was my hockey coach, I ended up in biology. And he was a wonderful, wonderful Christian, grade 11. He said to us, you know, if evolution, if you accept, you know, evolution does not have to undermine your faith. We can see evolution as God's way of creating. Now, I believe that's true. But if that's all you tell a 16-year-old, that 16-year-old will not be prepared or equipped to meet the onslaught of a public university education. Because in public universities, you often see it over and over again. Biology is conflated with an atheistic worldview. Think of Richard Dawkins, assuming that's the only understanding of evolution. 
And so what this book is, if you wish, is a primer for young people written with very, in a non-technical way. I, I introduce a few terms, but I define it and make them very clear. And the acts, it's to access them to say, should see evolution to be a really solid theory, you do not have to lose your faith. You can embrace your faith. And here's what you can do with scripture, for example. It's an ancient understanding of nature. I really focus a chapter on that. And the other piece of the puzzle is evolution. I mean, I, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I'm still active. I still do some projects in the paleo department. And the way I look at evolution, I mean, I look at how we're created in the womb. I mean, I've yet to meet a Christian who believes the Lord comes out of heaven, attaches an arm or attaches a leg to their developing body in their mother's womb. Instead, we see ourselves being created through natural processes, through embryological processes. And sort of as Psalm 139 says, that the Lord knit us together fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's womb. Well, why can't there be another set of natural processes that are the Lord's processes, and scientists call them evolutionary processes, whereby God knitted together, using Psalm 139, every form of life that's ever existed on, on earth, fearfully and wonderfully made. And yes, that's the design statement, that when I look at biology, it takes my breath away. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, anyone who's done molecular biology, you can't help but be suspicious. There's some sort of mind behind it. It is so unbelievable. And not only that, it's self-assembled. So here's God with one initial act, the Big Bang, sets up the Big Bang. So here we are 13.8 billion years down the road where we can have this conversation with the minds that God has created through an evolutionary process. And at the same time with these minds in our hearts, we can look up to God and, and praise him for what he's done. That's amazing, Dennis. Listen, listen, we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, okay. But let me just thank you <laughs> for, for coming on. I feel like we're just getting started. Well, so, we, can, we can always do this other times and well, focus I'm, in I more detail. Say, I was going to say, because there are all sorts of things that, that, that jump off of this that we can talk about. So let's, let's revisit these things um, Absolutely. at some point in the future, because this is a long conversation, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. And um, yeah, let's, let's do something. And the whole idea is to encourage the saints to love the scriptures, to love science, to love the Lord, and all these pieces can be put together. And, and, and I'm going to say this, Pete, I mean, your work is just absolutely wonderful. I mean, I, I, I just meet all sorts of people that you've encouraged and you've built up. And, and the one part is, think, think of that commandment where, you know, Jesus summarizes the two, the, the Ten Commandments and the two great commandments. And one of the part of that first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your mind. And Pete, you have definitely done that. You have, you have built people up with your scholarship, and from your scholarship, they now have an appreciation of the brilliance of the Lord and the, the gift that you've given them to love God with their mind. And I think this is, this is, this is a great part of, of being a Christian academic, is, is to be part of that process. Well, and I thank I you for that. that Dennis. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, we'll continue this at a future Absolutely. Time. And I appreciate your, and uh, b before we go, remind people, where can they, can they find you on the internet somewhere? Where should they go? Well, yeah, just put my name in Google and you will come to my webpage and I've got a number of articles. I've got a lot of video slides on there. Yes. And coming in towards the end of January, if you want to do something on this, I am, my entire course is going to be a MOOC on Coursera. Which, which is for free. People can do the whole course for free. Um, and so there's, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of um, avenues that they can do material for free. And if they're interested in the books, just put my name in Amazon. You can see a number of the books. And I, this, this, this one that's just come out in November, I think this is a, a good one for young people, uh, especially those going on to college education. This, is, this will help them um, um, not be fearful of evolution. Right. Well, I'm, I'm teaching a course in the spring on science and the Bible, and your book's right in the middle of it. So very cool. appreciate thanks. you doing that, Dennis. All right, Dennis, thanks okay. so much. Talk to you soon. Thanks. All right, you guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, friends. Thanks again for listening to another episode of The Bible for Normal People. 
Be sure to check out Dennis Lamoureux's books. He's got a big one, Evolutionary Creation, which is sort of his magnum opus, I guess you could say, but he also has a popular version of that, I Love Jesus and I Accept Evolution. Folks, you can't get any more direct than that. Um, so, and he also has another book, his most recent one, just came out very recently, um, Evolution, Scripture, and Nature Say Yes. It's a book that I've used in classes. It's a really, really good book for helping people navigate the difficult waters of evolution and Christian faith and dealing with the Bible and all that sort of stuff. And as always, uh, you can visit me on my website, PeteEnds.com or TheBibleForNormalPeople.com and you can get all sorts of information there that you might find helpful. Uh, you can find their ways to book me to speak uh, at your church or organization folks i'm always looking for uh, ways to sort of get out there and to connect with other people um, i like hanging out right with people who are kindred spirits and who are also exploring their faith in difficult times so you get information there to book me if you'd like and also information about my books uh, the one most uh, relevant to this uh, episode today is The Evolution of Adam, but also perhaps my two most recent books, The Bible Tells Me So and The Sin of Certainty. And finally, folks, if I can have your ear here for another 10 seconds, uh, Jared and I are very, very excited. Uh, we are uh, launching a Patreon page and that will go live August 24th and uh, we are setting that up to create an online community which has been our goal really since the very beginning. It's not just about me talking or Jared talking or our guests talking but it's about collecting people who have similar interests and a similar need to explore their faith and are working through all sorts of difficult issues about what is the Bible and what do we do with it. And, you know, you have a chance to support us at Patreon. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Patreon, but you have a chance to support us there and have access to all sorts of cool things like videos, um, uh, me answering frequent questions that I get via mail, which are a lot, and I think they're fun to go through. A uh, chance to have maybe a book study with Jared and me, a quarterly hangouts with us, and a chance also to give us feedback for the podcast because this is about us getting better and uh, forming that community and going someplace good with it and we're very excited about that possibility so be looking for that august 24th and you can find that at patreon.com forward slash the bible for normal people and it will be blasted on social media don't you worry so again folks thanks so much for listening we appreciate it and until next time